massive welcome to Michael Owen, um, Wales legend, British Lions legend. Um, absolutely superb. It's, it's so nice that you, you know we can welcome you into the uh, CFA community today, Michael, to speak to all our sports scholars. So thank you for coming in. Um, uh, first of all, what I wanted to say is um, we usually start these kind of um, sessions uh, just by asking about like your journey, um, and that can be your journey through school and into professional sport. Um, if you played any any other sports, and what were the key moments do you think that that, that set you on your way to becoming a a professional rugby player, representing your country, captain in your country, captain in the British Lions, and going to World Cups. So over to you, Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Liam. Thank you for the welcome uh, to Seaford as well. Um, Seaford was a scene of one of my worst nightmares um, <laughs> when uh, I, um, I, I, I so I work at Haleybury College now in um, in Hertfordshire, and I came to the to a sevens tournament um, at Seaford, which was absolutely brilliant. But um, I went to the wrong Seaford College. It was one of the worst <laughs> moments in my uh, teaching career at, at Haleybury. So we got, we got there in the end. It actually turned out to be our best day, our best sevens tournament. I think we lost in the final. So it was um, the chaotic preparation, put the boys on edge and got them right. But, uh, yeah, but So in terms of your, your, your question, Liam, I think, um, I think the biggest thing for me when I, when I started in um, uh, thinking about my journey in rugby, if you like, um, would be starting off with a dream. I think that was the biggest thing. I think it'd be the same for you growing up as a kid um, in, in South Wales. I was all I wanted to do was play was play rugby for Wales. It was I was absolutely desperate to do it. Um, and I think every time there was a there was a step to take. Um, I, I was there and I knew what was going on and I was clued into it and I knew all the stuff. So I was just uh, yeah just absolutely desperate to to play for Wales. So that was my so that dream. Like and then that fuels all your behaviours and stuff. So I can remember um, I was very lucky to have good role models and good influences and stuff in terms of my family. Um, so my dad um, I played rugby at a good level for a long time. Um, I was into his running and stuff, so he'd be he'd keep fit. So I do a little bit of thing of things with him to try and keep myself um, just trying to improve. And then I just played as much rugby as I possibly could. Really, I played loads of other sports. So I played. I was I was actually really when you reflect on it, obviously as you get a bit older. Um, really fortunate in terms of the support I had from my parents and the support we had at school. So my first um, rugby teacher, if you like, um, at junior school, a guy called Mr. Williams, was absolutely amazing, just really encouraging. He wasn't particularly a rugby uh, rugby guy, um, but he gave up his time, um, took us, organised loads of matches for us, took us to loads of matches um, and was just, just taught us to have good sportsmanship um, and to be uh, kind. That was certainly what his... Um, ethos was like so that was a really good starting point and then when we went to secondary school we had a teacher who at the time we all not didn't like him but didn't like what he made us do so he we weren't allowed to kick so you could only kick in your own 22 um and we all hated the rule because everyone obviously when you get a rugby ball you want to kick the new so you, you couldn't do that but then looking back so i was in school with a guy called gethin jenkins um so we were in the same year at school um, and he plays obviously gone on to have like an incredible career um, and we like I think we both would have been like the benefits of playing in that sort of system. Our handling would have been something that would have been maybe put us in front of others. Um, so it's definitely that opportunity was really good. Um, I also had like really good coaches at the junior level as well, my club side. So they were just re and again they, they weren't particularly brilliant coaches. And I think you don't know don't always need that. I think sometimes you're looking for answers from a coach, whereas actually it comes from like the environment you're in. Like if you're in an environment where you're not afraid to make mistakes, where you have a go, where you just feel like happy and content and you're able to express yourself, that's that's massive. And I think I had that like, all the way through my junior rugby. Um, and I suppose it only became a bit more demanding, I guess, um, where um, when we had when it got to like um, representative uh, level and things. So that was that was quite big. But those influences I think really shaped um, my outlook. Um, and, and help my development massively. That's, that's so nice to hear you talk about your, your role models at school and the teachers. And I look, I picked up a few things there, role models, um, having a dream to start off with, but the role models, being kind, I think that's really cool. And it kind of mirrors kind of what we, we talk about, our core values at Seaford, and one of them is showing respect. Um, and, you know, I think talking about the coach-athlete relationship there, um, did you find that the coach-athlete relationship changed a lot when you – Went to representative level. Um, uh, yeah, to how it, they want to play. Yeah, it was massive. Yeah, it was a massive change because um, I think it just becomes it loses. 
at the time, and obviously coaching has evolved um, incredibly over the last, like, from, from a rugby point of view, since he's gone professional. So I think things are in development teams a lot kinder um, and a lot more conscious of that like coach athlete relationship is something that's written about a lot and talked about a lot. But I think at the time it was definitely for me coming through, I think it was probably a bit more uh, separated um, in terms of the coaches were just like sort of maybe a little bit less sort of player coach relationship and more, I don't know whether right, like hierarchical, if you like um, a lot of the time, although in saying that it just made trigger me to think when I played for, so the first goal in Wales was like under 15s, you have district rugby and you play for the Dewar Shield, which is a massive um, competition. Like, um, so you, you represent your school and you get selected for um, your district side and you play against all the other districts in Wales. And we won the Dewar Shield with Pont de Prix, um, which was amazing. It was fantastic. And then you played for the county and then you went to the Welsh under 16s trials. So they were loads of tribulations and trials along there. And that was really good because I, I used to love it. I used to love playing rugby. So you'd have the trials and it'd be like nerve wracking, but then you're testing yourself and you go out there and try and do the best you can. So that was brilliant. Um, and maybe something that's missing from the the, the the development pathway now. I know it's changed a lot, and but it's maybe gone like too far the other way maybe. And you like obviously you moved away from trials, which I understand why. But then you do question sometimes um, why that's the case. But I was very lucky uh, at under 16s with Wales. I had a coach called Roger Good, who was a Cardiff schools coach, and he coached Wales. Um, and he was amazing to me. And he was like, it really stuck with me and certainly sticks with me as a coach. And he said to me at the, at the end of one of the um, one of the training camps where you maybe had like a one-on-one with a coach, um, and he said, I think you're a, you're a fantastic player. He said, I think you're the best player here. I think like some of the stuff you do is incredible. He said, the way you like run into contact and you move the ball from hand to hand, and, and you'll offload with either hand or whatever and all that sort of stuff. And it was just like really encouraging. And I was like, wow, really taken aback because all the rest of the time, everyone was sort of like, ham- like hammering you. Yeah. But then he was, he was brilliant in terms of, in terms of that. And I do remember him saying that. Um, and it, it's horrible because you never sort of, you never get a chance to go back and thank people for those um, like moments. But obviously as a teacher, you'd be like, you'd be over the moment you, if um, someone said, thank you for, you helped me on my way there. Um, so he was definitely someone who stood out amongst that, like elite coaches who had that sort of kindness and that, um, I, I, what's the word, like trying to boost you up rather than yeah. cut you down. I think sometimes in Wales, you have that sort of culture where you don't want people to get too um, full of themselves yeah. and overconfident. So you try and like chop them down. Um, whereas he was obviously took it the other way. And I certainly take that into my coaching. and I wouldn't be afraid to say to a player that I think you're, you're a fantastic player and keep doing what you're doing sort of thing. That's awesome. That's fantastic, that is. And I, I, picking up on that as well, and, and what you mentioned a little bit a while ago was about skills and, and that like, links into what you're talking about there. And um, I think when you first came on the scene um, in Welsh rugby, um, it was a breath of fresh air to see someone, a back row forward, someone of your size, um, getting around the pitch and but making, you know, linking and, and offloading out the tackle and the skill level, I think you showed, and I think you were in a poll, Mike, I don't know if you're aware of this, um, in the top 18 best players of all time, for, Welsh players of all time, you know, with regards to your skills and stuff like that. You know, I don't right. embarrass you now, but, um, but I think uh, I think your skill level, and I think that was a, like a, a change you when you came along, a change in kind of mentality and how to play. Um, so, you know, how important were those skills to you? And, and, and obviously that's the way that the sport has gone now. So maybe you were a bit of a a forerunner um, for that kind of way to play. So I don't know what your thoughts yeah. are on that. I, th- I think it's really nice to tell me that, Liam. I, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's, uh, but it was, um, yeah, I think, I don't know. I think it was very it was strange, actually. So I started playing when I was really young. So I was obviously at the infancy of professionalism. <laughs> I started playing when I was 18. So I was straight up. So I, I can remember play. It was an amazing thing for me. So I played, I played one week for Pont de Prix against Lethley on the TV, um, so it was on S4C, live on TV. I was standing in the line out and I was looking down the Fnathy line and they had all the well, like like four of the current Welsh like team. So it was amazing. And a week later, I played against my stig youth from Pont de Prix on a school pitch with no one watching. So just that contrast <laughs> was unbelievable. But yeah, that all that stuff, I think it's again, it comes down to the coaches giving you the confidence to have that skill. So when I first started playing for Pont de Prix, 
we played, we sort of mimicked what was happening in England and you play and you stand in like, uh, and England were really good, but, we, but they just played in a very different way and we'd mimic what they were doing. So you'd stand like one player forward, two behind, and they just sort of just like, we'd win the rack and you're very risk averse and you wouldn't sort of like throw a pass. But then we had um, Steve Hansen, Scott Johnson, Andrew Hort came in with um, with Wales and they just, they, they, we started playing like a super rugby style, which really suited the Welsh players because we had good skills. And then all of a sudden, I was just able to just, exp- the skills that I had, I was able to sort of unlock them because of the way we were training. So we'd train, we, and it was, it was probably ahead of his time, certainly in terms of the Northern Hemisphere. But we would just train, our training was brilliant because it would just be games all the time. So you just play touch games and do, you do passing drills to warm up. And then you play touch games that are really, really high intensity. But they were unbelievable for your skills. And I can remember, so we played Italy. And this was like a journey playing for Wales. So in 2002, we played Italy. First Welsh team ever to lose to Italy out in Rome. It was horrific. It was like, I think it was my fourth or fifth cap, something like that. And it was just, it was awful. And it was embarrassing. You felt like um, terrible. We played really badly. But we did score some great tries. But we but generally played pretty poorly. You just got um, like smashed off the park. There was a guy called Aaron Persicle who just jackaled and we couldn't like clean him out and he just win every rack for them and got all the turnovers and causes lots of problems. And then we training in this way. So training games all the time, you have to like get to a rack and hit the deck. So your urgency and everything was really like top level um, in training. And then um, I can remember playing it. We played Italy, the last game of the Six Nations in 2004 and Persico was still playing and we just absolutely blew them away. But when I can remember playing in that game, doing things, and you didn't even know, like you were just on autopilot because you were just playing like so, um, all your in- instinct and your reactions were so quick. You go to a rack. So we knew Persico was like a, a big target when it's coming into the rack. You go to rack because you were so used to just getting to a rack quickly. There'd be no one there to, to you just be there before them. So we just won with our mind. And I think that's a really important lesson yeah. in terms of when you're training because that's what you're training for. You're training for habits. So to get really sharp um, and, and that sort of stuff was was amazing. And in that game, for me, it was probably the, mo- the best moment that I had in a Welsh jersey, probably like one, if I had one highlight to show. And I think I was standing out in the centre and we play off 10 quite a lot. And I think I ran like a play um, and I went through a gap and I ran about 20 metres and I stopped and turned and did an American football pass across the field, like a 20 metre American football pass, which is like I said, I, I, don't, I couldn't say like why I did it or how, and we scored a try off it. So Duncan Jones, a prop catch and passed it to the winger and we scored, but I don't know why I did it, but it was just because of, I think because of the way we were training, you had such a heightened level of awareness. You were just able to do things without even thinking. And that was an incredible feeling of freedom to, to have. Um, and it was brilliant playing under, under those coaches in many ways. That's brilliant. That's, that's really, really interesting to hear that. And like talking about freedom and we talk about courage courage to do things and, and not be scared to do things um, and trust and having your coaches trust you like that is awesome. But I think, uh, like you said, about creating habits uh, within training, uh, we do, you do that as a team, but um, I suppose as, on an individual basis as well, um, when you started getting really serious about your rugby, what kind of habits did you kind of instill in yourself and have yourself to ensure that your, your progression and, um, and you yeah. move? I think I, I was, I definitely, like, I was thinking, I did a talk, like I said, at the school I work at now, um, but then and I reflected on this, it was quite interesting to, to do that, but I can remember, so saying about having that dream, but then, like, sort of taking the steps towards trying to achieve it, so I can remember when I was, so I got in the Wales Under-16 team, that was brilliant, and then I tried the next, uh, but then it's like all the time, I think this happens all the time in, rugby, in sport, you meet one challenge, and then the next one comes along. So I played for Wales under 16s, which is like would have been a massive goal of mine for say two or three years. Um, and then the next thing I got to try and get in the uh, uh, Welsh under 18s. So I mean, you're trying to play a year young, so that's a big challenge. Um, and I can remember you go to training camps. So every school holidays you go to training camps, and I guess that's what people say about when they talk about the sacrifices you have to make and the things you have to give up. Um, but then like. For me, I can remember you get given at that time. It was very different to how professional rugby would be now, where you'd have like we have boys at our school who are like aspiring professional rugby players, and an S and C coach would come and visit them and take them in the gym. 
um, and all that stuff. But when I was when I was coming up through the ranks, like I say, it was the infancy of professionalism. You go on a course and you get you go on a camp for two or three days, and it was really hard and it was brilliant. But then you get um, a, a booklet about fitness, so there'd be a speed, there'd be a few speed session options on there. There'd be some weights options on there. There'd be like all this sort of stuff. Um, and then yeah, and I can remember I get up before school, so I was doing my A levels, but I get up before school and go to um, the local field and go and do like the interval training that I had to do. So I put I was putting the effort in to try and get better and improve. And like one of the best things we had, so when you got, I did eventually get into the Wales under 18s team um, at, at the, a year young, which was brilliant. Um, but then we had a game. So you played like according to the school holidays. So I think it was say it must have been February half term you played two games so we played Scotland and France in the first two games and then you'd have all the rest of that term then up until and then at Easter time you played England and Ireland um, so you had that however long that would be I don't know that could be about like me I don't know maybe six to eight weeks something like that in between the terms so you'd have and that was it so I can remember training religiously for that England game um, and that was like sort of the first time where I probably like really like pushed myself to try and get better. And I was very fortunate. My parents bought like a multi gym um, for the garage. I'd go out there and do a bit of training and stuff. So like really committed from from a young age, I guess. And um, and yeah, and then like and I think that's the thing. It's not about you might not get what you what you want. So I I might not have been fortunate enough to play for Wales under 18s, but because I was working towards it. I'm making it more likely that good things are going to happen. And I think it's the same for your pupils, your students. Like if they, if they're able to say, I want to play at the best level I can for whatever sport it might be, then you've got to put in the the, the work um, to be able to get there. So to play at the top level of university sport, you have to put in that work to be able to go there and be competitive and show your best, whatever sport it is. So I think that's the lesson I would say, not necessarily about the success, but about like putting in those steps to try and um, to try and get better. That's brilliant. Thank you, Mike. And, and we, we've been talking with the scholars through lockdown. I'm sure you all have with your guys um, about making yourself better during during this period and coming back stronger, coming back fitter. And we're talking about being mentally and physically strong. So, you know, that covers the physical side of things. But I'm sure when, you, when you're physically fit and when you're training like that and you're, you're achieving those, mm-hmm. those micro goals on your, your journey, uh, I'm sure that kind of helps the mental side of things. And was was mental the mental side of things um, played at the top level a big part of um, the training and the coaching and the- I think it is huge I think because like when I read so talking about I was really fortunate enough to play with some amazing players um, and I think like for myself it would have gone through periods in my career where I was playing like really top level rugby or performing at my uh, close to my optimum and it would have been times where I can remember a time when I was at the Dragons and I go I go in early. Um, to meet the fitness coach and do extra speed sessions. So I do that in the morning. Then I'd have like some food. Then I go and do weights. And then you so I was doing extra stuff to be able to, to try and get better. And the fitness coach would come and meet me and was investing in me and helping me. Um so I think that every time you do those little things, it gets you a little bit more focused and a little bit more driven and a little bit more determined. So it's just all of those little things do that. And if you get your diet right and all that sort of stuff, it just like chips away. And then I just think about some of the people who I play with who are probably the most professional players I play with. I think I think someone like not someone people would normally associate with, but someone like Gavin Henson um was like an incredible professional. He was also like he's probably the best and worst professional I played with. So when he was on it, when he was like and I don't know what it was in terms of his psychology, but in terms of, right, I've got a goal and I want to achieve it. He was, like, unbelievable. He trained incredibly hard, really focused, and a tremendous talent. Um, but then when he wasn't, he might be at the other end of the spectrum and disinterested and, and like, a distraction to people. I think that we're just looking at his career from a distance as well um, and up close, obviously. But you would have seen that, like, that contrast. And then when we went in the Lions tour, someone like Johnny Wilkinson was just on another level. To people, but it's interesting listening to him talk. Is a, pod, a high performance podcast, yeah. which is really good. And he was talking on there, and he's saying about how um, sometimes it caused him like like mental turmoil and stuff because he was so um, like meticulous and stuff, and so hard working. So it's like it's trying to strike that balance, I think, isn't it, between like giving it your best. But I definitely think that mentality side of things definitely improves as you um, 
as you do your training, as you do your diet and everything like that. And then the other thing that comes down to, I think we're, we're just thinking about my career, really. When, when I had coaches that backed me and wanted me to do really, like, and not want, because all your coaches want you to do well, but who really believed in you and thought you were a good player, it, it just made a massive difference and, and you flew. Like, so I was like, I had a coach by Mike Reddick, um, who I would, like, as a, like, just saying about Steve Hansen, Scott Johnson, now they were brilliant. And then with Mike Reddick, Mike Reddick, I don't think, he ever had, did anything to help me as a coach in terms of like you didn't say put your foot there and like sidestep or whatever whatever he just again just gave you that uh, freedom she so just picked me all the time and told me I was really good <laughs> and then <laughs> that made me feel brilliant and I went and, and played well like and it was just like so those that's when you have those coaches I think that makes a big difference oh thank you man that's brilliant I'll tell you what I could I could ask you questions all day um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to open it up to the students now. Miss Miller and Mr. Bird have uh, been kind of getting questions in from the students. So I don't know if um, Mr. Bird, Miss Miller, have you got any questions you'd like to ask, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. I go first, Miss Miller? Yeah, sure. Mr. Bird. So um, I've had a, a question here from Henry. If you were to give one sort of piece of advice to a, a young aspiring rugby player, what would it be? Um, enjoy it like it's the, the number one like thing just to make sure you appreciate I think um, lockdown has obviously been pretty unprecedented it hasn't been um, a great deal of fun but I think it makes you appreciate all the things you do so I think really try and appreciate it like I'm sure when you're at Seaford um, you get like a tremendous provision you've got coaches and teachers who are obviously really invested in you um, so just like make the most of it um, and enjoy it and embrace the opportunities that you're presented with I think Sometimes, as as a, as a teacher, you can feel frustrated when you're putting things on for the kids and stuff, and then they're just like, "Oh, I might go, I might not," and they don't turn up with commitment. When you work with someone who's committed and who just throws themselves into stuff, it just it makes it makes you a better coach, and it makes them helps that helps them to progress. So just enjoy it, um, take every opportunity, and just throw yourself into it, and yeah, just have a have a great time. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Mike. Great answer. Um, another question from Oscar. Um, the way that you've sort of spoken about your career so far, it sounds sort of like it was a really good sort of steady transition from sort of junior representative rugby to, to sort of senior professional rugby. Did you have setbacks along the way? And, and how, when you had setbacks, do you, were you able to deal with those? Um, you, have, you have so many setbacks. It's, um, I think, yeah, like me making it sound like it's um, like a smooth journey. It really wasn't. And I think it's just, it's a little bit of, for, of good fortune. So I had an operation, um, on my on my back when I was like uh, seventeen, um, and I so I was after yeah so when I was seventeen and then the that year the uh, under nineteen World Cup was in Wales um, and Wales got to the final and I was lucky enough to play in it but at that point we played it to the away um, and I just come back from injury I was just about got on to, just about got myself fit to be able to to and got picked on the bench um, and then a boy got injured in the warm up. And I got my opportunity and I was like, got to be on the bench in the first place. But the boy got injured in the warm-up and then that gave me an opportunity. And once I took that opportunity, he didn't get back in the team. So it's like those sort of bits of fortune are important. Um, and then I think, yeah, just like every time. And then one of the things I was good at, every time I had a setback, um, I'd come back like stronger, if you like. So I'd have a setback. So And the, the setbacks as well, it could be, I can remember things like I got picked for a Wales development tour um in 1999 or was it 2000 say in 2000 they got picked for the Wales development tour which is all the young players um went over to Canada um but I did I was like down the pecking order on that trip so I was like at the bottom of the back where I was so I came back from that trip gutted and frustrated of, of, with where I was so then I went away there in that summer and trained harder and came back uh, a better player so I think all the time you're always trying to overcome setbacks, um, and that's yeah, that's the big challenge I think of uh, of trying to make it in in a sport or trying to do better. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. Um, from Ben now, um, you've played in some massive matches. Um, sort of a two pronged question, really. How was your preparation going into your matches? Did you prepare differently for sort of the so called bigger occasions? Um, and what was, in your opinion, your biggest game? Um, the, so the, the way you prepare for games, I think it's, it's all is like you can you put on like uh, I don't know like you sometimes you're faking it and sometimes it's real and I think that's the difference. Like if you I can remember we played like 
Um, we had an autumn series playing for Wales and we played Japan. And you go in Japan at the time, we were very good. And we were going into the game and you know you're going to win. And and it's not it's not the same as if you play New Zealand. So we played Japan and you knew you were going to win and you could just go out there and just play your stuff. And we won, I think, 98-0 and it was easy. Um, but then we played the All Blacks. Um, and that's like your you've got a bit of everything, like probably the best sort of sport. And that was answers the other question. It was the best game I ever played in. Um, but it was, so it was 2004, Wales against New Zealand. Um, and New Zealand were an unbelievable team. They were like probably like, it would have been up, that team they had would have been up there with one of the best teams they've ever had. Um, so pretty special team. Um, and then they, um, we played them at Cardiff and we, we, we lost 26-25. Um, but we played unbelievable. We stood so sometimes like Northern Hemisphere teams would struggle to stay with New Zealand, and they might like play like a kicking game and just like tackle and hang in the game and lose by five or ten points. But we played New Zealand. We stood toe to toe with them, and it was like we went. We played r- brilliant rugby against them. It was unbelievable. But just before the match, in terms of that preparation thing, I can remember we um, facing the hacker. But before the game, you, I can remember waking up on the morning of the game. Um, and going for a walk and I can remember just having like adrenaline surging through my body because I was so excited about playing so I was like trying to just like oh I gotta I gotta calm down you know I can't um I can't think but I couldn't sleep and I was just up and excited and desperate to play and I think that comes down to your, your preparation and training and um, your level of excitement your belief in your team um your belief in your coaches and in that in that match we like, like I say we played unbelievable it was just an incredible occasion so I only seen this photo once and I don't know where it is but it was myself Colin Travis and David Jones in the back row and we are facing the hacker um and obviously it's like it's one of the biggest spectacles in sport and we played at the Millennium Stadium and it was absolutely incredible packed house flashlights going off it's probably the first time I played for Wales where because we've been improving where the crowd really believed in us and it was like an extra man it was absolutely incredible. There's a photo, and it's myself, Colin Chavez, and David Jones, and we're standing there, and, you, and we look, we just like look like bigger than we are, um, and you just like standing there, like ah, just really determined looks on our face, and just like a bit of excitement as well. So you're just absolutely desperate to, to play against New Zealand, and it was just an incredible occasion. I can remember in that game, we just played all out, everything you had, um, and unfortunately we came up short, but it felt like the best, like as good as rugby could get. It was amazing. And there was a guy on that day, it was the first time. So the hacker is always the last thing that happens before a match. But in that game, the guy who was in charge of the stadium, like the order of proceedings, he arranged for Win Evans, who's the um, Go Compare guy. Um, so he's an amazing opera singer. But he walked on after the hacker. So the hacker's gone. So everyone goes after the hacker, goes and takes the tracksuit off, comes back on the pitch, and there's like a little bit of a of a delay. But as during that time, we were standing there waiting for the kickoff, for the kickoff. And this guy, so it's Win Evans, so a guy, well shirt on, holding a flag out, um, and just starts singing Bread of Heaven, which is like one of the like this equivalent of Swing Low Sweet Chariot um, at Twickenham. And um, he starts singing, the whole crowd is going off, everyone's just standing there, flashlights going everywhere, and you just feel the hairs in the back of your neck standing up. So that was just like absolutely the the best um, moment of my sporting career, and just a shame that we that we didn't man, didn't quite manage to get over the line and beat New Zealand. Amazing! I feel like I feel like I was there, Mr. Bird. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what? I was there, and it was amazing. And and do you, do you mind if I quickly show a, a clip of it, guys? It, we all right with that? It was a great question. Should we just show a little clip of that? And if I can share screen, let's see if it works. Because like you know, what an amazing thing to face your blacks at Pack Millennium Stadium. And uh, let's have a look. See if this this works now. Two seconds. A minute. Right. Uh, go. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> I'll take the pressure off you, Liam, and tell a, a bit of a story oh, from the oh, game oh, as well, oh, all right? Oh, so oh, there was a guy playing in that game. Um, I know it's like as a teacher as well, when you're sweating on whether you can get that video to work here. <laughs> so it's, uh, the pressure's on. Um, but yeah, so um, in that game, there's a guy called Mervyn Davis playing hooker. Yeah. Um, and he was he'd been released by the Celtic Warriors in Wales and ended up he wasn't didn't have a professional contract and he played against the All Blacks um, and, he, and he scores a try in this game it's one of the most incredible moments I've ever seen from someone oh, working yeah, so hard that's a great lead up I, I, thank you Mike you filled the time well then I'm, I'm in I think <laughs> I think oh, can you all see the screen guys give me some thumbs up yeah brilliant you are Wales versus New Zealand 2004 <laughs> autumn series um, let's have a little look the roof is closed. What's it like to play under that roof? 
Yeah, it's unbelievable. The stadium, honestly. So when but the thing that I think people don't realise, like I went. Um, so when you when we when I started playing for Wales, it was like you play and everyone would be really excited going to the game. But because Wales had been poor for for a little while, and um, they turn up to the game and be a little bit like um, expecting you to, to not to do well. So you start off, everyone's really excited, but then the first tie, first minute, New Zealand score a try, everyone's a bit like, oh, here we go. It's not going to be great. Um, and you feel that as a player. But I think in this game, because our performances have gradually been improving, um, so the World Cup in 2003, Wales played really well, and then um, building up in York, and we done well against South Africa. So people were sort of quite expecting coming to the game. And then when we delivered um, quality performance on top of like people's expectation and excitement, it's just it's, a, it's an incredible stadium. It's right in the middle of Cardiff. Um, yeah, just can't can't tell you how amazing it is to play there. And that's probably I'd love to be able to do that one more time. That'd be like a, a wish I'd have. And it'd be such a such a contrast now um, for this weekend when Wales England and no crowd. Yeah, they decided in Wales or the first minister announced earlier that uh, they're going to abolish all the lockdown things and they're going to have a full <laughs> crowd in Wales for the, no, just for this one off occasion. Crowd. Right, let's have a look, guys. See if we can get some of the atmosphere. Then he straightens, tackled by Mevin Davis. That's fine, leave it now. There's the ball. Turnover. Turnover for Wales. Now they must have numbers. Stephen Jones. Gareth throwing in inside him. The chip instead for Tom Shanklin. Shanklin against Lau Lala. Shanklin! Fifth try into international. Do you know what? I think uh, that just gives a little glimpse. It's six, six and a half minutes. I could watch it all day, but um, I won't. I won't put everyone for you know do that. But uh, Mike, I must have been amazing just watching that back there and the emotions coming back. Um, that's awesome, absolutely awesome, and, and some fantastic questions, guys, as well. Miss Miller, have you got any questions you'd like to ask, Mike? Yeah, I've got a couple from um, just different students in the room, um, and maybe not necessarily completely rugby related, but just more so from an elite, um, you know, performance. Um, point of view so we've been talking a lot in lockdown about like our core values and our behaviors um, that we sort of want our school and our players to abide by um, and we were wondering what sort of core values you would have um, and essentially you're like non, non-negotiables if you were to go out and play and that you have within your yourself but then also as a team as well. Yeah I think one of the really important things I think sometimes what happens with um when people talk about core values and stuff, it's, it becomes they become just words. Um, and I think the most important thing is you have to be you're, if you're going to like say those words, you have to live by them. Um, and I think it's about um, the people at the top, so the people who are in charge. So if you're a captain, if you're a, obviously if you're a coach or a teacher, if you're saying those values, you really have to live them. So you can't say about honesty and then like lie to someone about why they dropped or things like that. It's just undermined straight away. So I think it's really, really important that when you come up with values, you really think about them um, and think about what's important. So I think that it come back to that thing I think about being kind. I think that's a massive one and about like trying to lift people up. And I think that's when sports at its best as a coach, as a captain, um, being able to lift people up and make people do um, like more than they think is possible. I think that's that's in essence that's what like sport is all about. Um, and that would be the one I would say. I'd say, like, have that kindness, but then lift people up. So when you're a young person as well, and you see it in school all the time, it's so difficult for young um, aspiring sports people. I see a lot with the boys in terms of, so when they're, like, in year seven, year eight, they'll just sort of, they just get on with the game, and they don't get distracted with things. And then as they start again to year nine and year 10, they start having to show, feeling like they've got to show that sort of bravado. So they get involved in trash talking with the opposition, um, they get involved in maybe sniping at the teammates and stuff. And I think that's the, when you're looking for someone who stands out as a sportsman or sportswoman, you're, 
looking for people who don't just go along with that trend because that's the easiest thing to do. You're looking for people who are able to rise above that and see what's happening and actually lift people up and make people feel good about themselves and make people do well. So if someone makes a mistake, you're there, you go, don't worry, let's go, let's go again, next job, let's do it, doesn't matter. And having that sort of approach rather than getting on someone's back and being like, and I think when you, and it's really difficult as a, as a teenager and stuff as well, because you, you're going through loads of things, but then that sort of, when people start sniping and bringing people down, that's when you have like a really um, poor culture. And I think with, with any sort of values and stuff, I think it's important to keep it simple um, and keep it to things that you can that you can live up to. Um, so I, I think for me, it'd be that kindness, lifting people up, um, and just about the effort as well. And I think that the word uh, Mr. W used the courage, and that's like sort of the LinkedIn to, um, to to that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I think it's important. The stuff we have at school, we talk about attitude, skills, and athleticism. But not, not so much values, but it'd be like that. Like they would be the three things you're trying to develop. So in every session, trying to develop those three areas. And obviously, it can, they, they add, like, you can add loads of parts to those, like, um, three sort of keywords. But a value is in, uh, the values that are most important are the ones that the leader um, displays consistently because they're the real values and not just words up on a board. Brilliant. And then um, just a fun one to finish from me. Um, so if you had, so skills aside, and you were absolutely amazing at anything um, and every sport, what sport would you choose if it wasn't rugby that you would play professionally at? Uh, when I was a kid, it would have been football, definitely, because I love I loved football. Um, and I fancy my chances as a footballer. Um, it was actually, that was one of the best things, actually. In that, in the, so in 2005, we won the Grand Slam over I'm in that New Zealand game. And with Mike Barrett, we used to play football all the time in training. It was amazing. So we'd have, like, it was, it was brilliant. I guess it'd be, like, or it'd be distributed practice, wouldn't it, when you're talking, like, A-level terms and stuff. But it was, um, we'd play, we'd practice our line-outs and then go and play five-a-side. And the level of focus on us as players playing football was, was off the scale compared to everything else. But it worked, and it was, it made it fun. Um, and it, it just gave us that break and stuff as well. So that was really good. Um, but I think if it was going to be, a, like, yeah, I'm probably, yeah, rugby, football, those sorts of sports, basketball, like a bit more of an invasion game player. So, um, or world's strongest man. He could be world's strongest man, wouldn't he? Fair play, fair play. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant questions, guys. And thanks, Mr. Miller. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bird. Um, can we can we keep going on the leadership theme there, Mike? Is that all right? And um, yep. you were, you know, you've had an amazing career and um, you were lucky enough and, you know, deservedly so, uh, asked to captain the British Lions in the Millennium Stadium against Argentina prior to going to New Zealand on a tour. Um, what was that like to be asked to captain the Lions or even get into the Lions squad? Be asked to captain and, and then a little bit about the tour and your main takeaways from the tour. That's a long question, but... Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. Right. Um, yeah it was, um, I think, it was obviously an incredible honour. Um, it, it was a funny game because it was really... Um, sort of quite it was organized quite late on um but it was yeah it was obviously incredible to be captain like johnny wilkinson was playing in that team and a number of the english guys um and it was really collaborative and everyone sort of sort of got on um and yeah and i, I was it was amazing to captain them and it was like uh, i think it, that tour wasn't successful and that was probably for a number of reasons um but i think what i would take was so i just to go back just a smaller story it was um so when we played for the, prepared for that game it was, un- it was unbelievable. So it was in Wales and we prepared, we trained at the Vale Hotel, but the, the training venue we used was in um, um, the University of Wales, uh, University of South Wales now, um, training fields. Um, and I trained there as, a, as an 11 year old for Ponty schools, as a 15 year old for Ponty Pre schools, as a, as a playing first team rugby for Ponty Pre, then training with the Lions. So all of those things, there's such a significant part. And I sat in exactly the same spot for each one of those teams. And I can remember sitting there, waiting um, to find out the team and stuff and being like, oh, fingers crossed I'm playing. Um, so that was like an amazing, like sort of weird like coincidence that, that happened. Because obviously it's probably the only time the Lions have ever trained there. Um, but yeah, it was incredible. And it was incredible to see some of those players working in the way that they did um, and learning from them. Um, and then in terms of the tour, it's just that thing, I think like, it, it, the tour became from because Kai Woodward was in charge of it and he tried to do something really innovative and really different and approach things differently which you have to admire but it didn't work um, but then like 
I guess you like you, when you see the Lions to a sense, they've sort of done everything. There's been like it's had uh, the true um, sense of the Lions in terms of being like together and have enjoying the country they're in and not making it like too cold and too business like. And I definitely think there's a danger of that when you're in sport and professional sport particularly, and if people are like aspiring in academies or uh, development systems where um, like you could get caught up in the business of it, but actually you've got to try and find the pleasure in sport because sport doesn't change. It doesn't matter whether you're playing for um, your, your school team as a, as a 16, 17, 18 year old, or whether you're playing for, for Wales in terms of your approach to the game, it's not going to be very different. And but you've got to make sure you get that enjoyment out of the game and just, um, and just show your passion and how much you love, love being involved in the sport and playing in it. That's fantastic. Enjoyment's kind of, you know, it, all these things are really so. It's the essence of why we start playing sport, and why should it? Why should it change? You know, I suppose it's really, really important to keep that going, have a common thread through. Um, World Cup, Mike, in two thousand and seven. Yeah. Um, you, you know, like um, going to a World Cup, um, rugby World Cup, football World Cup. It doesn't matter. It's the, it's the pinnacle uh, of someone's career. Um, what were the main lessons you've learned going to France and? And playing for Wales in a World Cup, and what did you? Yeah. How did that help you the rest of your career? Yeah, um, so that was my life. It was a bittersweet um, the World Cup for me. Um, so the 2003 World Cup, I was selected to go. I had to pull out with a back injury about uh, like two days before we were due to leave. So that was really horrible. I haven't done all the preseason and all the work together. So that was a that was a, a really horrible uh, thing. But like I say, I came from the setbacks I had attended to come back um, like as a better player. Um, and then in 2007, I sort of we won the Grand Slam in 2005, and then a new coach started. Uh, it's only in it's only, it could only happen in Wales, couldn't it? Um, <laughs> and then in 2006, a new coach started, um, and he, he, I was like sort of sidelined, so I'd gone from being captain and a main player to not being part of it, which is obviously his prerogative. Um, but um, I then. So before, and then like that summer then I had a bit of a lull in terms of my form and I didn't I wasn't reacting very well I was a bit low um, and then I managed to, to get myself together and come back and I came back better than ever and I was I, really proud actually getting selected for the World Cup so I just had to fight and try and prove myself and I trained really hard got myself fitter stronger faster um, and I was in a really good place and I think at the time going to the World Cup I was in as a player I was probably at the peak of my powers because I had the abilities that I had I was fit and strong and I had like my my brain and my experience levels were really good so I was in a place where playing international rugby wasn't going to phase me and I felt like I could have performed really well but I didn't get the opportunity in the World Cup I was on the bench four times um, played in each match but uh, but didn't get off the bench I didn't get into the start in 15 which was a shame but I, looking back I was really proud of it like I say but then that was my last involvement with Wales as well so I played against Fiji in the last game I lost like in an amazing match, but lost 38 36. Um, and then, yes, and then that was, that was the end of my career. So it was bittersweet. But going to the world, the goal, I think that would be what I would take from it. Like when you have that goal, it's really powerful and it's what sort of fuels you on and fuels you to to, to excel as an individual. Um, so I think like finding those goals and then putting the steps in to work towards it um, is, what, is what I guess like your high performance um, like group is all about, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you, Mike. And, and do you mind if we talk about it? You know, obviously you left Wales then and um, you left Wales and went to Saracens, got signed for Saracens and worked with a, a very famous coach, Mr. Eddie Jones. And do you want to give us a little um, over, well, overview or um, an understanding of, you know, what Eddie Jones was like as a, as a yeah. coach? To play he was, yeah, he was amazing. So, like, um, incredibly meticulous. So I was playing for the, for the Barbarians um, in... Um, Twickenham against um, South Africa um, and Eddie Jones arranged to meet me I met him in a hotel went to meet him um, and he knew everything about me um, and he just had a chat to me and just said like I think um, I think you can be a really important player for us I think you can be a senior player sorry we want you to come to South Africa. we want you to be a leader we want you to be a senior player we want you, want you to utilise your skills and we want to see you playing at your best what can we do to help you to be at your best um, and I was pretty convinced then to go and sign for Saracens, I did, um, and he was fantastic, and he was an incredible coach in terms of, he was incredibly intense, but to me, he was absolutely amazing, so I got injured, I played, and it went really well for the first, like, um, the pre-season, and the first, like, three months of the season, 
And then in January 2009, I got injured and it turned out, I didn't think it was that, I ended up, I did my ACL, I did a full knee reconstruction. So I had the operation, I was out and I was there and I can't remember what I was doing. I was looking at like the computers and stuff and looking at some of the match footage and there'd been a stat on the weekend um, on the games that were on that came up that said about um, number eight and how many carries it had and how many offers. And I was like top of the premiership rankings and I'd had something like, I can't remember, say I played like, the 11 matches, say, and I'd had, oh, how many, 150 carries, and then I had, like, um, like 35 offloads or something, and then nearest to me then was, like, eight or something like that, so it was, like, a real, like, anomalous thing, and he said, and he's like, Mike, did you see those stats yesterday? I said, oh, yeah, I saw them, yeah, and like, I, like, I'm being Welsh, as well. not because you're Welsh, but, like, generally, don't tend to be, like, um, tend to be quite modest and humble about stuff, um, and he was like, Mike, when you come back, you're going to be the best number eight in the premiership. You're going to dominate, Mike. And he's saying that stuff. And it's that thing, again, about giving you confidence. And he wasn't like that with all the players. But to me, he was incredible. He treated my family really well and looked after us. And he was he was amazing. And, it was just, um, and he was very, very meticulous and attention to detail and driven. Um, and he'd, like, he'd have things like eight, uh, training session starts, 8.30. Leave the change rooms, 8.30. Ch- training will start, 8.34. 8.39, warm-up will be complete, 8.48, like, it was, like, that sort of thing, so that attention to detail obviously gives confidence, and he worked incredibly hard, um, and, yeah, it was it was brilliant, I would have loved for him to stay on and, and be there for longer, but, unfortunately, the ownership changed at South Sands, um, and then it was very, just different, like, the other, new the incoming coach didn't think, didn't think the same of me as Eddie Jones, <laughs> so it wasn't so good. Oh, fair play, thank you, Mark, and, and, um, and obviously, like, you know, big thing um, was the, the the Grand Slam, 2005 Grand Slam. We got England Wales this weekend. Um, you were captain of the side. Um, was it? It was it Ireland the last game, wasn't it? Yeah, we played Ireland in the last game. Yeah, last game. And then again, I was there, and it was it was a cracking match and uh, an amazing time for Welsh rugby. And I was the start of Welsh rugby. I think getting going. Um, you know, kind of thing. It kind of kick started the rest of what's been happening, and, and they've been doing you know obviously very well over the last however many years. Um, but you you had to retire at twenty nine, Mike, didn't you? So talking about setbacks yeah. and stuff. How how did that you know how did that affect you and how did you bounce back from that? Yeah, so I think like going on that two thousand and five, that last game against Ireland. So I touched on it earlier about driving into the stadium. It was absolutely incredible, and we saw some of the scenes afterwards which we weren't aware of. But you drive into to Cardiff, um, and you drive through the main streets, and the amount of people that were there that day it was a beautiful day. And it was absolutely packed. And they reckon, like, when we saw the scenes after, it was like half a million people in the square in Cardiff, plus 70,000 in the crowd. It was like, <laughs> it was something else. And they showed us, like, videos of, like, the troops in Basra. And they were going crazy because Wales had won. It was the first Grand Slam in 27 years. So just an incredible time. Um, and, yeah, it was, um, yeah, that was an absolutely amazing experience. And then, yeah, I was unfortunate. I had to finish the training. And I had two back-to-back uh, knee reconstructions, um, which I didn't quite manage to recover from. Um, and I guess what you learn, I think um, you learn about, um, I was lucky, I think I reflected on it and I, I felt like I'd had, like I started playing professional rugby when I was 18. Someone had said to me, you have 11, 12 seasons, I think I played. They, they, if someone said to me, you have 12 seasons, but this is what you'll do, but you have to retire a bit younger, would you take it? I would have like, bitten their arm off, I would have been more than happy with it. Um, and actually, it's probably for me as a person, so I married, I've got three kids, I had, we had them young. Um, and it's probably been the best thing that's happened to us because our lifestyle is much better in terms of um, like when you're a professional rugby player, obviously requires a lot of sacrifice and you're very much up and down according to how things are going and you're away a lot. And it's, in, it's like sort of a, it's inconsistent. Um, so it's like sometimes a difficult uh, environment and, and difficult also like, like lifestyle to lead, especially when you've got a family. Um, but then, yeah, I'm really lucky. You got like lovely wife and, and children and stuff. So then, I've just had them supporting me, and then yeah, I just had a different, different journey and a different adventure. So for that, the last was it like uh, ten years, ten eleven years, I've been um, like doing different things. I managed to do some some commentary work, uh, some speaking stuff, some coaching, and then the teaching and things like that. I went back to university and did my degree. So yeah, so it's been it's been uh, interesting. I probably. Uh, grown uh, more as a person and stuff in that time um, than maybe I did when I was playing rugby. But yeah, it's been been amazing. I've um, I've enjoyed every part of it. I think it's just so having being that optimist. I think Liam, isn't it? It's, try, it's important to try and see um, the best um, of the situation you find yourself in. Oh, I tell you what, Mike. I'm conscious of time now, and uh, and I like listen. I 
I think it's been absolutely awesome today, you know, chatting to you, getting a, an insight into professional uh, sportsmen, um, which applies to all sports and, and um, you know, netball, hockey, it doesn't really matter. You know, some of the messages and the, and the, the learning we can take from today is just is outstanding. You know, and it just sums it up for, for me, you know, um, you know, the, the epitome of, of hard work, stay grounded, you know, you know, working hard, aiming high, achieving so much uh, in sport, but, you know, humility and staying grounded, spending time with us this afternoon. Um, it's just, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure, Mike, every time I speak to you. So uh, thank you ever so much. Can I just ask you one last question, bud? Yeah, go for uh, it. That's okay. Wales will win on Saturday. Oh, they will. You are. So they can hear the news coming. Do you think Wales do? Uh, I don't know. It's going to be. I think England are still favourites because they just got so many good players. Yeah. Um, but Wales are on a roll. Um, and yeah, I got my fingers crossed that uh, the Wales can pull through and get another result. Especially when you live in living as an exile, Liam. It's important, yeah. to you, isn't it? It is important. <laughs> it is important. But listen, Michael, thank you ever so much, guys. All the students for listening. Uh, all the staff for uh, uh, the questions. Some absolutely brilliant questions. Um, absolutely loved that today and um, and Michael thank you again and welcome you're always welcome to Seaford you know where we are now I do know where you are now yeah <laughs> you know who we are now okay so uh, and we, we know you're always welcome to Seaford anytime you, you, you want to come down and hopefully we'll see you at the sevens next year thank so you thanks ever so much Mike